Welcome to the opening press briefing of the 80th uh, IATA Annual General Meeting. Um, my name is Tony Consul. I'm the Head of Communications at IATA, uh, and it's a pleasure to be moderating this morning's press conference. Um, we have an excellent slate of, um, of people at the podium. Uh, first, we have Yvonne Makolo, who is uh, our outgoing chairman, as well as the CEO of Rwandair. Um, we have Sir Tim Clark, who just uh, presided over the uh, IATA Annual General Meeting and, as you know, is the CEO of Emirates Airline, our host uh, for this event. Uh, and we have Willie Walsh, the Director General of IATA. Um, we'll take uh, we're open for questions. There'll be no opening statements. Um, please raise your hand. Identify yourself before the question. Um, and as this is an industry uh, event. We would like to not have specific questions on specific airlines, but rather about industry issues. Um, so if I could ask for your cooperation with that, that would be great. Um, who would like to ask the first question? Maybe we'll take a question in the middle. Michael, come around to you. Hi, Tony. Thanks. Um, Twan Ren from uh, Air Transport World Aviation Week. Um, question to uh, Willie uh, specifically uh, on turbulence. I know there is a safety panel later on, but I want to hear it from you. Um, the, of course, uh, turbulence has been in the topic right now. Uh, and NTSB sometime in 2021 uh, published a report recommending FAA to update its uh, turbulence uh, processes uh, and procedures. I was wondering uh, if uh, IATA is doing anything on, on your end to promote um, turbulence safety, uh, and uh, if not, uh, why not? Thank you. Yes, uh, well, I'm pleased to say we, we have developed a, um, a product to support the industry. It's called Turbulence Aware. Uh, what Turbulence Aware does is it takes data from aircraft uh, in uh, real time. Uh, so if there's a turbulence event, it will record it. Uh, it will then send details of that to other aircraft who are connected to the system to make them aware of the extent of the turbulence, the location. Uh, in the past, historically, as you know, I, I used to be a pilot, so uh, uh, turbulence is not a new issue. Uh, you know, when I started flying 45 years ago, turbulence was a factor that we had to deal with then. Um, and when you experience turbulence, what you tended to do was make a report to air traffic control that you had experienced turbulence, you would sort of grade it uh, in terms of whether it was light, moderate or severe, and then air traffic control would pass that information on to other aircraft in the uh, location if, if they had the opportunity. Um, and of course, uh, turbulence at that stage, uh, you know, go back to when I was flying, it was your perception of the turbulence. Uh, the way we're doing it now is this is measuring the change in acceleration, the g-force uh, that the aircraft uh, experiences. So it's a much more accurate assessment of turbulence. So when you look at it, you know, we have areas of forecast turbulence, uh, be that from uh, cumulonimbus, limbus, uh, you know, thunderstorms, or areas of clear air turbulence, that's forecast. We then have reports from pilots who experience turbulence, but this uh, new system that we have, Turbulence Aware, measures data in a real-time basis and uh, links that data to other aircraft who are connected to the system to make their work. So there's a lot going on. Um, turbulence is not a new issue. You know, as I said, we, uh, turbulence has been a factor in the industry for, for many, many years. Uh, obviously, uh, we will continue to assess the recent events to understand them better and see if, if there's anything else that can be done. But there is a lot of work going on to ensure that uh, we continue to move forward and enhance the safety of our operations. Uh, you know, we, as I said in my remarks, we, we never stand still, we never rest, we're all the time working to continue to improve. Okay, thank you. We'll take a question on this side of the room. Richard Schumann, Airline World, uh, speaking about the emission targets, you said in your speech that reaching the 5% emission reduction in 2030 is ambitious. Of course, you are pushing for the industry to produce as much stuff as possible. But would there be uh, a point in time that the airline industry could say, slam on the brakes and uh, stop growth? You are always growth oriented. But just for uh, emission reduction targets, growth should be reduced. No, I, I don't see that happening. Um, and I'll tell you why I don't see that happening. Typically, this debate around whether growth should be suppressed is a European debate. And it's solely a European debate. And it's solely in certain parts of Europe. 
you don't have that discussion in other parts of the world. So you saw the presentation from Peter Elbers, the CEO of Indigo, uh, about their ambition and what aviation is going to mean, not just to Indigo, but to India. And when I travel around the world and uh, meet with airline CEOs, talk to regulators, talk to politicians, outside of Europe, they have a huge appreciation for the value that new conductivity will bring to their economies. And I, and I think uh, when we discuss this from a European context, uh, I think we're quite arrogant, actually, uh, to believe that the rest of the world should follow what Europe is doing, because the rest of the world has not had the benefit that Europeans have had. The rest of the world wants to have the benefit, and uh, aviation will unlock huge economic value in countries like India. You know, Yvonne talked about Africa. Uh, Africa today, it's only 2% of uh, commercial aviation. It should be much higher. And, and think of the economic contribution, what it would mean for people, the ability to travel, the ability to connect, the ability for business to uh, reach uh, new opportunities. So there is, outside of Europe, I don't hear any discussion about uh, suppressing growth. In fact, quite the opposite. Uh, people are, are yeah. um, I, I, I share Willie's view. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I uh, personally, I'm a, I'm a, a growth um, animal, if you like, you can call me that. Uh, we have organically grown my particular business side of it, but the, to the point that Willie was making about the value of uh, civil aviation to the global economy, regional economies, continental economies, is it's uh, a walk in the park in trying to understand all that. It really is very easy to understand, um, and I don't think we need to spend too much time on that. The, the trick of the business is to, is to reduce the carbon footprint of what is, is going on. And there are so many initiatives, many of which Willie alluded to, the difficulties of implementing some of those roadmaps. But the industry, um, certainly the airline industry, and everybody around it is single-mindedly focused on getting the carbon footprint and decarbonizing what we're doing at the pace that is manageable, but we are absolutely fixated on getting the job done. And uh, I don't know of any, any, uh, any airline known to me that doesn't have the same resolve in getting it done. We know the difficulties. We'll get there in the end. But you know, don't, don't underestimate the power of what the industry is doing to try and play its role in decarbonizing the global economy. Not easy, it's the hardest one to do in my view. But everything that Willie has said and all the problems that we face, both politically, socioeconomic, regionally, are there. But we still have to cut through and we will do that. But to reduce growth and prevent so many people having the benefit for the very good points that Willie made about certain parts where they've all made about Africa, South America, the developing world, wanting to get the benefit of it and have yet to reach those kind of levels of connectivity that the, the developed world have, have enjoyed for so long. It's time, you know, we can, we can help out, but we've just got to be smart about what we're doing. I'm sure we can do that. Okay. Yvonne, did you have... Well, I, I think uh, Willie and Tim have, have put it very well. Uh, in the context of Africa, we we're talking about 54 African countries. How do we connect them and, uh, if, if we don't uh, leverage uh, air connectivity? Uh, there's limited roads, uh, non-existent railway. So air connectivity is the only way to go. So uh, saying that we need to slow down growth when we are barely <laughs> Uh, cracking the 2% uh, global traffic uh, number uh, really doesn't make sense. So the focus should be on decarbonization, but not slowing down growth. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll take a question just here in the middle. Chris, you had a question or? Yes. Uh, Chris Sergeant from Green Air News. Uh, Willie, you devoted quite a lot of your uh, speech this morning to sustainability issues. Um, on the one hand, you said, uh, net zero, the net zero target was absolutely possible. I think those were your two words. And yet you did spend quite a lot of time criticizing governments for not really stepping up to the plate. How do you square that one? Well, it's, it's very easy. Um, as I said in my uh, comments, we're aligned on this. Governments, politicians worldwide and the industry aligned on achieving net zero in 2050. It can't be done by airlines alone. It has to be a combined effort. Everybody must play their part. And it's not good enough that governments say we're committed to it and then stand back and don't 
put the policy frameworks that are required in place, or worse still, introduce other measures that go counter to the ability to achieve net zero in, in 2050. So the example I gave of France, you know, mandating a uh, SAF blend, the mandate on the fuel companies, if they don't achieve it, the fuel companies are penalized. But you're penalizing a monopoly who just passes that cost on to the airline industry. Zero environmental benefit and huge economic damage. So what we're saying is you know, our actions need to be aligned with the ultimate goal of getting to net zero in 2050. And that's what Tim said. A lot of measures will need to be taken. And we need governments to do in the same. We're not asking for anything special. We're just asking them to do what they did to make solar power a possibility, wind power a possibility. That didn't happen without the support of governments. It didn't happen without having the, the right incentives in place to accelerate significantly the production of solar energy and wind energy. And we want them to do the same for aviation. Okay. We'll take a question in the front. Hi, uh, Shahara from Trav Talk Middle East. Uh, the question is also on sustainability. Uh, one side of it is how, uh, especially from the Middle East, uh, you serve the end customer and how you can actually ensure that the end customer also has um, doesn't need to pay extra for sustainable aviation fuel. This is something that has been coming up, uh, especially at different forums. So I'd like to have your take as airlines and IATA as to what you would do to ensure that the customer will not have the burden in the end. So, so let me address it from an industry perspective and then I don't know if uh, Tim and Yvonne want to comment. I'm sorry to say, but the transition to net zero will require customers to pay. And, and you know, I, I would love to think that we as an industry can do it without support. But I go back to the uh, financial figures that I quoted in my speech. Uh, so this year we expect to have an industry that's at uh, profitability with net margins of 3%, 3.1%. Uh, you know, as I said, Starbucks 11 and a half, we're 3.1. The best we've ever done is, is five. Uh, fuel is our single biggest cost. This year we estimate our fuel costs will represent 31% of our cost base. Uh, sustainable aviation fuel is more expensive than jet currency today. Um, uh, and, you know, there's no real market, but it's at least three times more expensive. So those costs cannot be borne by the industry, given the wafer-thin margins the industry has. So as the costs uh, increase, as we transition to net zero, I'm sorry, but, you know, we will do everything we possibly can as an industry to keep our costs under control. But ultimately, uh, you know, costs will increase and those costs will have to be recovered and that will probably in all uh, probability lead to an increase in the cost of air travel. I, I just don't see how we can do it any uh, different way to that. Um, just to add on to what Willie has said, which I agree with 100 uh, percent, and in the context of uh, especially of African airlines, where we are already paying such a margin on, on uh, conventional fuel, if SAF comes at three, four times uh, more than uh, uh, the regular fuel, the, the cost will have to be passed on. And for African Airlines, uh, uh, fuel is not the 31% that uh, Willie is talking about. It's 35 to 40%. Uh, so someone will have to take the hit on that. Um, <clears throat> just briefly, I can add to that. <clears throat> the, um, as Willie says, the, we are at the beginnings of a long journey with regard to SAF and uh, decarbonize the economy. Uh, you read the metrics, you saw the metrics with regard to how much is actually produced at the moment. That comes in, as Yvonne said, three or four times the price of a litre of JP1 today. The trick of all of it is to get the feedstock, if you're going to deliver, to the levels that you want, which allow you to introduce, and this requires government investment, uh, multinational investment in the refining capability, and the, uh, the, the increase in the type of feedstock that you're going to need. So eventually you scale. If you scale, your unit costs fall, and therefore the price of that particular thing will fall as a result. But at the moment, what we're looking at is 0.5%. I think that was fairly generous. I've heard 0.1% is, is of SAF today. To go to 5%, do the maths. 
um, is very difficult. And it's, it's not so much the cost of doing that, it's actually getting there. How are you going to get feedstock? How are you going to get the incentives for the multinationals to build the refineries or convert old refineries to doing something with animal fats or hydro-processed uh, stuff, which again has its own issues with regard to the footprint and what you're doing with those. Um, so, y you know, it's, it's, it's not looking good. And as Willie says, in the end, when you have monopoly situations, we have a situation in some countries where a mandate comes along and they said, you must do this and you must pr produce 5%, 10%, whatever it is by 2030 or whatever. When the government is asked, how do you do, do, do you propose doing that? They say, that's not my problem, that's your problem. And the supplier says, well, I can't do it. So I'll have to import it. But the same import uh, requirement is being requested by many other countries to do the same thing. So then you get a, a, <clears throat> an auction. And then you get the, the uh, hedges getting involved in it. You get arbitrage on, on, on SAF. It becomes totally out of control if you're not careful. The governments have got to be stronger about how they do this, recognizing the difficulty of getting it done and scaling that down until we get to the point where you can actually introduce some kind of science to produce green hydrogen. Um, and even that requires huge amounts of power. But if we can cross that river in the 2030s and 2040s, scale that, but that requires a lot of power just to do that, then you can start seeing the cost falling per litre of fuel. But at the moment, we've got, we've got a long journey ahead, and it's difficult, and it'll be expensive, but our main goal is to try and get the amount of SAF into the aviation industry at the levels that everybody wants, the consumers want, uh, the governments want, and that's not an easy task. It's, it's, it's almost played around with as a political football. It is not. It is something that we need to have a rational, grown-up discussion about the realities of what we're trying to do here. And some sense has got to prevail. At the moment, it's becoming a politi political football, as Woody says. We're seeing it all over the world. Different countries taking different views about what they um, regard as important for them. We've, he's mentioned Europe, we've seen it in other parts. And Corsair was the thing that was the one thing that gave us hope that we could come together and somehow come up with a, a mechanism of trying to uh, move the business on to that 2050 target. Um, so we've got a lot of work to do and there's a lot of uh, what I would call a froth that has appeared in the narrative in the last five or six years which are compounding our ability to get the job done. <coughs> Okay, we'll take one more question here and then we'll move towards the back of the room. Good morning, Mustafa Ablazim from Al Ittihad newspaper. My question moving from SAF to uh, the uh, delivery issues. Uh, how far do you see the, the impact of delivery issues to, on the airlines' growth in the future? And how Emirates and the leading uh, airlines uh, dealing with this issue? Um, what was the. Uh the delivery airfield for new orders for... Uh, oh, sorry, yes. yes. Um, uh, well, I, I, I mean, we, we, as an industry, it's not just Emirates, we all face the same problem, uh, whether it be the uh, OEMs, the major airframe manufacturers, or whatever, there are, we all face the same problem. And, and you know, notwithstanding with the SAF arguments, etc., the industry is hungry to grow its business and acquire new jets, more fuel efficient jets, etc. But they're hamstrung by all the things that we know. So I, I don't think Emirates is any different to, you know, Randair or all the others in it. I think you're absolutely right, Tim. You know, it's facing every airline, I think is the cause of quite a lot of frustration. Um, you know, many airlines see opportunities to expand their network, want to provide services to new destinations and can't because they, can't get delivery of new aircraft. It's also caused some airlines to keep in service aircraft that they had planned to retire, and in some cases to bring back into service aircraft that they had announced that they were retiring and putting into storage. All of this adding cost, uh, it's not helping our journey to net zero, because clearly part of that journey is investment in new technology aircraft that, as Tim says, are much more fuel efficient. So I think it's the cause of a lot of frustration in the industry at the moment. But there's nothing any individual airline can do. We just have to uh, wait for the OEMs to sort out the challenges that they face and uh, start serving the industry properly again. Okay, we'll take a question at the back. 
Uh, I'm Jagrati from India. Um, there has been a lot of frustration around India's refusal to revise its bilateral rights. Um, but there have been recent media reports where uh, it seems that the government is interested in offering one S24 to, to Dubai and one S29 uh, seats for Kuwait, which means for every one seat uh, that uh, Dubai gets, India should be able to get four seats, and similarly for Kuwait, one S29. Uh, your reaction on this? Um, really? I, Please, well, you comment, and then I'll, <laughs> I'll comment in the general context. I, what the Indian government chooses to do, and what it, how it, it chooses to run its um, <clears throat> its aeropolitical uh, policies is up to India. Um, and if they wish to propose that uh, solution on a four to one basis, they can obviously engage with the, the governments. Like I said, we, we, are, we just execute the policy. So I'm not swerving it, but I'm simply saying these are intergovernmental uh, issues that need to be resolved at governmental level. I am hugely optimistic about the opportunity for India. Uh, I look at India and I, I, I'm just amazed at what potential exists there. Um, back in 2000, the Indian domestic market represented 0.4% of global aviation. Uh, last year it was 1.8%. So it's growing and it's actually growing at quite a fast pace. But when you consider that the Chinese domestic market is 12% of global aviation, you look at the potential that exists in India. And it will only be unlocked, it will only be unlocked with the right government policies in place. And I suspect that will happen in time. And if India is to fulfill the ambition of its industry and to play its part as uh, you know, global carriers, well, then it's going to need access to markets around the world. And uh, if you want to get access, you're going to have to give access. You know, that's, the way, that's the way it works in the airline industry. But I, I remain really optimistic, and I'm looking forward to the IATA AGM in 2025 in India, because I, I think we'll be able to have a great debate about you know, what the future could be like in India uh, if the right framework existed to facilitate the enormous growth that I think uh, exists there. Okay, next question. Um, maybe we'll take it right here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Furukawa from a Japanese uh, economical uh, newspaper, Nikkei. And uh, I have just one question about uh, Boeing uh, quality. So uh, Iwata uh, has just updated the passenger volume forecast in this year. Uh, but I'm afraid the uh, Boeing uh, matter uh, could be damaged their uh, forecast. What do you think about it? Sorry, I, I didn't hear the, the, the question at the end. I think the question was, will, will the issues at Boeing damage the forecast for industry growth? Uh, sorry, no. Um, you know, we have factored in uh, issues relating to the uh, current state of deliveries uh, from the OEM. So. Uh, it, it is suppressing growth at the moment, uh, without question, but we factored all of that in. So our forecast takes into account all of the known events that are going on around the world and uh, anticipates uh, to some degree how long those uh, issues will continue. So I would say the current forecast that we have reflects the uh, current state of the uh, uh, Boeing uh, deliveries to the industry. Okay, uh, we'll take a question on this side of the room, maybe second row. Hello, uh, Lee from Aviation Business News. Will you briefly address um, the issue of airlines getting the data from their aircraft in your speech and how that relates to the relationship with, relationship with OAMs? Recently heard Airbus talking about wanting to be open with the industry. So they're talking a good game. Are they actually delivering on that? And what does that look like for you going forward? And, and maybe Sir Tim and Yvonne can also address that from their perspectives. Yeah, I think, I think we're making progress. I think the discussions we've had have been very constructive um, and moving in the right direction. Uh, we're still, we're, we're not quite there yet. Uh, but I think, again, there's a common agenda here. You know, we're all aware of the value of data and what data can mean for uh, the improvement in efficiency of our operations, the improvement in safety uh, of our operations. And we want to be able to 
access as much data as possible, as efficiently as possible, and take the benefit of uh, you know, artificial intelligence to interrogate that data. So it's a common agenda, and we are, as I said, having very constructive discussions with the OEMs at the moment. Hey, next question, uh, maybe we'll go to the middle. I think Mike is coming from the back. Yeah, perfect. Hi, Chris Chamberlain from Point Hacks in Australia. A uh, question for Sir Tim. As long-range narrow-body aircraft create new opportunities for airlines to fly point to point up to 11 hours in a single aisle in some cases, how do you see that impacting network carriers more broadly in the longer term, those that build their businesses on carrying passengers through a primary hub? Um, well, I, I, uh, I fret a little bit about capacity restrictions. If you're talking about 11 hours on a single aisle aircraft, you've probably got a, uh, a capacity payload restriction on that, probably as much as 50% of the passengers. So is that going to be economical to do that? Is it going to be sustainable to you would fly multiple city pairs over ultra long range with a 50% passenger seat factor? I mean, if you want to go from Zanzibar to um, Glasgow, um, you, you know, it probably makes more sense to cobble all that together into a single hub, a super hub, and feed with smaller units going out to, on, on a hub and spoke basis, on, as we do in, in Dubai. In fact, it makes far more sense, it makes far more environmental sense of flying uh, single aisles over medium to long range operations with, with the capacity not there, or rather the demand not there. Um, so I, I, the, the model to me doesn't really stack up. It does within regional operations. It does within dense routes. So we see that in Europe, we see that in America, we see it in South America, um, to a less extent, of course, in Africa. But I don't really see uh, how the uh, economics of single aisle over medium to long or even ultra long range missions, um, is, is it really going to work? Uh, and I, 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 I honestly believe that the future of airlines operating out of mega hubs, such as Dubai and the one that we're going to build in the next 10 years, will just add uh, weight to that particular argument. Just wait and see. And I, I completely agree with uh, Tim on this issue. Uh, you know, people who predict the, the end of the hubs are, are you know, failing to appreciate the dynamics of this industry. Uh, you know, I said this yesterday. I can remember making a speech in London in 2011 when I predicted that Dubai International Airport would overtake Heathrow as the number one international airport in the world within four years, which is what it did. The value of a hub is absolutely incredible, and you can see what it's done to transform Dubai. You cannot recreate that with uh, new technology, single aisle aircraft. So, you know, the, the, the hubs that you see around the world uh, are critical to economies around the world and will continue to be. There is a role for these uh, longer range single aisle aircraft, uh, but the economics are, are, are quite challenging once you get, I would argue, probably beyond six, six and a half hours. And uh, therefore, you know, there is a role that they'll play, but you know, the idea that somehow it will undermine hubs, you know, that's not gonna happen. And uh, you know, I would predict that the, the growth that we see in the major hubs around the world will continue at pace because of the unique ability to connect that point-to-point uh, know, -to -point operations, regardless of how efficient these single aisle aircraft just, just can't replicate. Okay, we'll take a question at the back. Hello, Gianni Dragoni from Il Sole 24 Ore in Italy. I have a question for both uh, Willy and Tim. Uh, um, the European Union Commission has adopted a more restrictive approach on merger and acquisitions between airlines. There are two cases pending for a long time, ITA, Airways Lufthansa, Air, uh, Europa, IAG. So I would like to have a comment from both of you on, on this and about um, Chinese uh, um, aerospace industry, uh, what do you expect for the new Chinese jets arriving on the market? Um, you know, given that it's a European question, allow me to answer it. I think consolidation has a part to play in the industry. Uh, you know, we have seen significant consumer benefit from some of the consolidation that has taken place. 
I, I think the question we have to ask and what regulators have to answer is what happens to these smaller inefficient air airlines uh, because they can't generate the scale on, the, on their own. What will happen to them if uh, that consolidation doesn't take place? So, uh, you know, I think we're all interested in ensuring that consumers have the maximum benefit possible. Uh, that can often be achieved through consolidation in a way that uh, the absence of consolidation, you know, won't provide that benefit. So, uh, you know, we'll wait and see. Obviously, it's a decision for the regulators, and the regulators have to determine whether the consumer, consumer will ultimately benefit. Um, so we'll wait and see. But, uh, you know, I've seen the value of consolidation in the industry in many parts of the world, and, and I think we'll continue to see uh, efforts to uh, consolidate in Europe. And on China, Comac, uh, I think, doing a great job. The, the 919 has entered into commercial service in China. Uh, orders for the aircraft are, you know, very significant, but primarily targeted at the Chinese domestic market. Uh, and when you look at the size of that market, I think there's incredible scope for Comac to grow in that market. I think uh, expecting Comac to challenge Boeing and Airbus outside of China and uh, uh, associated nearby countries, I think that's going to take considerable time. Um, but uh, the, you know, I, I've visited Comac and I've uh, visited the. Uh, the uh, C919, and I've listened to Comac about their ambition with the C929. It's great to see it. You know, I think further options for airlines going forward uh, will be important. <clears throat> Just on the consolidation issue, <clears throat> it's clear that if you look at the American markets prior to deregulation in 78, and then what happened after that, and what we have today. The uh, industry is far more efficient in the way it goes about its business and the product that it offers. And I can, as, as Willie said, I think you'll see more of this consolidation going on in Europe. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't like to see small carriers go out of business. None of us do in this business. But the fact of the matter is that if they are not absorbed, the simple uh, hardline economics that underpin what they do will may force them out of business. The, the main thing here is that if you are going to um, allow a consolidation of market power, you must regulate with a high degree of vigilance to make sure that market power is not ab uh, abused and the consumers are protected from any part of that. So it's, it's no point pay, paying lip service to it. If you allow consolidation, you allow the formation of large groups, watch what they do. And providing they play the games and they look after the interests of the consumers, then you know, it's, 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 it's a fair deal. But you've got to keep your eye on what goes on. And they can do that. That's, I think that's the way they need to go, rather than prevent what is a commercial imperative in many, uh, many cases. As far as uh, Comac is concerned, well, now is the time. I mean, they, they have a golden opportunity to move ahead and um, take advantage of the supply chain OEM uh, legacy manufacturers that are existing today. And, you know, if they, they, I think they've got somewhere to go. They have to get their aircraft onto the uh, uh, American register, European register, et cetera, et cetera. But knowing the Chinese, they're probably going to be fairly versatile and fairly quick in upgrading their standards of uh, build and uh, safety and propulsion and all the avionics platforms that are currently provided in some respects by Western technology. But in, in they'll probably, probably get there. So, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see how they, how they move that market on. As Willie said, if he's been there to see them and they look in good shape, well, you know, you never know. Okay, uh, we'll take a question maybe on this side of the room, on the, the left. Oh, okay, do the first, first row and then the second row after that. Okay. Uh, Owen Curry, Travel Extra Dublin. Uh, question for Willie. You say the uh, chapter is enclosed on Schiphol and we have a not dissimilar debate in your home city about a passenger cap. Are uh, restrictions on airports becoming uh, a thing uh, in the wider environmental debate and what needs to be what needs to happen in skip in skip on in particular uh, again uh, going back to the comments I made earlier it's uh, it seems to be almost solely uh, associated with European airports so the three airports that uh, have issues at the moment skip all where the government wants to reduce slots uh, Brussels where the government is uh, making changes to how it operates and Dublin Airport which has a passenger cap 
which is relating to surface access to the airport. It's nothing to do with uh, runway capacity, terminal capacity, how the aircraft uh, operates, but how people get to the airport. Uh, the idea that you're going to suppress growth opportunities because of uh, restrictions, in the case of Dublin, I think date back to 2007. I may be wrong, Owen, you'd know better than me. Uh, but you know, restricting the growth at Dublin Airport um, because of a decision that was taken 15, 16, 17 years ago, uh, which is completely different to the, the environment that we're operating in today, I don't think makes sense. And I think the Irish economy will suffer uh, as a result. Because the growth will just go somewhere else. You know, it's, it's not as if uh, this isn't going to happen. It just moves. Uh, you know, so in the case of Dublin, Ryanair will move aircraft to other airports where there are growth opportunities. Aer Lingus will not expand their transatlantic operations. Uh, but people will still be flying. They'll just be bypassing Dublin, and uh, Dublin will miss out on the opportunity. So you know, we need to keep a close eye on this. But we don't see at this stage, similar discussions in other parts of the world. Um, again, I go back to the, uh, you know, the opportunity that many uh, countries see to expand their network and expand connectivity, which is quite different to uh, some of the things we've seen in Europe. Okay, we'll take a question in the second row. Hi, John Gambro with the Associated Press. Uh, this is kind of a simple question, but Everything that you guys have spoke about so far seems like it's additional cost that's going to be passed on to the consumer. So should consumers expect to see airline prices or ticket prices continue to be at the same level or higher moving forward with the challenges with SAF, with the challenges of not having enough routes, enough seats for these routes? What can the, the consumer expect? Thank you. Well, again, I'll talk in a general context, and Yvonne and Tim can talk specifics. Uh, this industry works extremely hard to be as efficient as possible. And you, you've seen what we've said in real terms. It's cheaper to fly now than it was to fly 10 years ago. Uh, if you look at inflation figures, and, and we've monitored this very carefully, uh, you know, ticket prices uh, going back to 2018, 2019, have broadly kept pace with consumer inflation. Um, and that's despite the fact that the inflation that airlines have experienced is much higher than consumer inflation because of what's happened with uh, the price of jet fuel, where we've seen a significant, significant divergence between the price of crude and the price of jet. So you know, the airlines will continue to do everything they can to keep costs in control as much as possible for the benefit of consumers. It's in our interest to do so. But I think it's unrealistic to expect that airlines can continue to absorb all of the costs that we're likely to, uh, to face. Uh, in the same way as other industries uh, you know, have had to increase the prices to consumers. So uh, it's not something we like doing, um, but it's something that we have to do. Because we need to have a sustainable financial model that allows us to invest in uh, our products and services for the benefit of consumers and to ensure that uh, you know, we can go on this marathon to achieve net zero in 2050. So you know, it's not that we want to put prices up, uh, but I think we have to be honest. Uh, and this is where I think politicians need to be honest. Uh, because I, I think politicians who sort of uh, talk about increasing taxes or increasing uh, you know, re requirements uh, for an accelerated transition to net zero uh, try to present that as uh, coming at no cost. You know, the transition to net zero for every uh, industry is going to be challenging, but particularly so for aviation, given uh, the fact that we don't have uh, any easy option available to us. And I, I think we do need to be honest that, you know, if the costs uh, increase, and in the short term, given the huge differential between the, the price of jet and the price of SAF, uh, you know, then you know, consumers will, will have to uh, recognize, and as Tim said, it's something that everybody wants to do, but we'll have to recognize that those costs uh, can't be ignored, and airlines will have to uh, you know, continue to do everything they can to minimize that. But I think ultimately, uh, ticket prices, as we've seen uh, with the impact of inflation on other services, ticket prices uh, you know, may well increase. Yeah, uh, just to add on to what uh, Willie has has mentioned, any any change in terms of the cost to to the airline, 
uh, it'll be very difficult uh, for airlines to absorb that. Uh, uh, speaking in the context of uh, where we operate in, in the African continent, any incre whether it's SAF, whether it's additional airport taxes, which are already ridiculous, or any other uh, changes that are made, uh, the airlines will, will not be able to absorb that. So it'll be passed on for sure. Um, you know, I share the, the, all these views. I, uh, I'm, I'm a believer that <clears throat> as we move to, to say 10% SAF by whatever date that is, as you're starting to scale, the unit costs will start to fall. This is very important to understand that. Um, in the short term, yes, if you are uplifting 10% of your fuel and it comes at three times the price of SAF of uh, JP1 today, then obviously it'll have a knock-on effect on the pricing. My own view is that the blending of that with the uh, fossil fuel prices, if they remain in equilibrium and they don't go off the clock, that there's a chance that we can absorb <coughs> excuse me, some but not all of those cost increases in the business. And secondly, you, you, you know, it's, it's, as Willie said in his presentation, the, the margins that we make as a business, and I'm not playing the victim here, and I don't want people to get boxes of tissues out or play the violins, but the fact of the matter is, it's been a, an industry which has become so hugely efficient over the last 50 years, far more so than other industries who have fed off what the aerospace airline sector does, and they have produced stellar margins for themselves and for their shareholders. And at the same time, the airline industry is, is I think, compared to when I came to the business a long time ago now, and I way, see the way airlines go about their business and have benefited from scale economics, the likes of which I've never seen in any other industry to date, that um, it, is, it is quite amazing that ticket prices are where they are today and i think the value for money proposition that the consumers have had the benefit of for many decades is is something that is one of those hidden uh, bits of the narrative but we've done i think and i would say this we've done a great job We've tried to keep all our costs under control. We're a highly competitive industry, and that obviously drives control of costs and how we position ourselves in, in the business against e each other. And um, I can see that as we go forward, the business, and we talked about consolidation, if we do that wisely, the ability to scale and reduce your unit costs and it, it strip out costs in the business, which are already paired to the bone, I have to be quite honest, but there is more that can be done. It's possible that we can absorb some, but not all, of this progression towards SAF until such time as that we have alternative fuels which come to us at the same price of fossil fuels today in real terms. That's all I'd say. But, you know, it's something we just got to get on with, I suppose, and, and, and live with. Okay. Thank you very much.